or this is the Committee on Community Resources February 27th meeting. Um, we are being audio and video recorded and uh, Laura, would you please take the roll? Sure. Councilor Shara. Here. Councilor Goodwill. Here. Councilor Klein. She will be late. And Jake. Councilor Nash. Present. Um, we are going to start with public comment. If you're here for the public forum on um, retail marijuana, feel free to wait till five when that um, forum will be. Uh, but if you're here on another matter, um, please come up and if there's anything you'd like to say. Hi. Hi. I'm Benjamin Spencer. I live at 8 West Avenue. Um, what brought me here, um, Mr. Goodwill had sent out an email that you know, detailed what was going on at this meeting. And included a um, drawing of the um, paths, some of the paths up at Village Hill the, um, for the next phase. And um, I was very pleased to see that the paths that are being included there are a part of this, because it uh, really makes for a really wonderful loop that you can take at the um, walking trails. Um, and that was it. I basically wanted to sort of commend the people who decided to keep those paths active and, and continue to have access. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Anyone else who public comment? No? Okay. Then, uh, first thing we're going to do is um, approve the minutes from our previous meeting, January 29th. Is there a motion? Move to approve the minutes. Okay. Any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor? Aye. 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 No objections, no abstentions. And then the only thing on our agenda before um, we have our forum at five is um, the order to accept an easement at Village Hill. Um, order 18.030. And I will read it quickly and then Ms. Mish is here to talk about it. Um, are you? If you need any, I mean, yeah. Okay. If you have any questions. Okay. Um, so, in City Council, February 1st, uh, 2018, upon the recommendation of the Office of Planning and Sustainability, 18.030, order accept an easement at Village Hill, ordered that, whereas Mass Development, such the Community Builders, now Hospital Hill LLC, received a special permit for the master plan and redevelopment of the former Northampton State Hospital. Permit originally dated seven, uh, September 19, 2002, with subsequent amendments, whereas the special permit identified areas for permanent open space protection and public access to and through the open space from the developed portions of the property for the purpose of providing non-vehicular non access from the city to the project area and across the project area north, south, and east, west, whereas each development project at the nor former Northampton State Hospital has included various links that created a connected network of pedestrian and bicycle trails from, through the project, <coughs> whereas the city council has accepted the other various sections of these pedestrian and bicycle links whereas Kent Picoy and Sons <coughs> Construction Inc. received a permit for the subdivision of the land and site plan approval on May 18, 2016, and included the offer of all the public access easements as part of the development and in accordance with the original special permit granted for the redevelopment of the Northampton State Hospital to provide north-south, east-west connections, <coughs> as substantially shown on the attached map, be it ordered that the City Council accepts the easements as shown and authorize the Mayor to sign the public access easements in order for them to be recorded permanently at the Register of Deeds. So this was referred to us. Um, is there a motion on the floor? I would move uh, approval of the order. Second, Second for a positive recommendation? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so discussion, Any discussion on? I would only add, oh, I'm sorry. Well, this is pretty much um, that my understanding is all of these details are already in place up at Village Hill, and this is really just formally accepting those, uh, the trails that were discussed and all of that, correct? That's my understanding, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, most of these, I mean, the, the paths, north of the cross lots were certainly are, have historically been there for you know decades mm -hmm. um, overgrown to some extent but 
the idea in the original special permit created in 2003 was that there would be a continuous north-south connection and east-west across. And then these, uh, but as the developments came forward and sort of fit into the existing network of trails, they had to be massaged a little bit or, or connected to in some way. So this, um, this permit uh, formalized that um, connection and required certain improvements on a portion of them. Um, and then, of course, this piece of it is making it public, you know, publicly accessible through a permanent easement, uh, which hasn't wasn't ever there before. It was just sort of they were just known to be um, paths that people could use, but they mm -hmm. weren't really public. So, so the pink are the, are the trails, right? The pink part. Yeah. The um, the. The wider one on the left is actually a wider easement, wider than the actual trail. Mm -hmm. And that is because the grades um, in that area do not, um, are not consistent or are not um, accessible and inaccessible to mass DOT standards for a trail. Um, so at some point in the future, um, if the city can get grant money to create a more, um, serpentine connection that would meet ADA requirements, then we have a wide enough swath in which to do that. But right now, the trail is just straight and much narrower than that width. But otherwise, there isn't really much, um, there aren't many improvements to make the other bits accessible, because they already are, or they were created accessible as part of the construction. Um, only I, I suggest we, we refer to committee so that folks in Village Hill would have a chance to just be sure they knew it was happening. We didn't expect any particular controversy, but I did hear from one other Village Hill resident that they were really happy to see this moving forward and hadn't realized there was a mechanism in place to make these paths permanently publicly available. So uh, it is, it is nice to see this phase of it um, reaching this, this stage of completion. Great, excellent. So there's no further discussion. Um, we'll um, all those in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. 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 Objections, abstentions? Okay, so that moves forward from us. Um, is there any other new business that anyone knows about? <clears throat> no? Okay, if not, then what we um, are going to do is actually recess until 5 yep. for the public forum. on recreational retail marijuana sales, which are scheduled to begin in July. Um, I will go around and introduce ourselves again. We had uh, we convened before, but um, I'm Julia Shara. I'm the Ward 4 Counselor and the Chair. I'm Dennis Bidwell, Ward 2 Counselor and the Vice Chair of the Committee. Elisa Klein, uh, Ward 7 City Counselor. Jim Nash, Ward 3 City Counselor. Um, so thank you. I'm just going to talk really briefly because we have a lot to cover. Um, I just want to say, so presently the Cannabis Control Commission is on their second day of three days of policy deliberation on amendments to their draft regulations that they released back in December. Um, yesterday they voted to postpone licensing of home delivery services and social consumption locations. I don't know what was discussed today. Um, the final regulations must be released by March 15th. Applications for licenses may be submitted starting April 1st. Um, we're going to begin our forum today with three brief presentations from groups in our community, from our Northampton Board of Health, from, and they'll be followed by uh, New England Treatment Access, NETA, um, who'll speak to their experience in implementing medical marijuana um, regulations and providing services here in Northampton. And then the Northampton Prevention Coalition and Strategic Planning Initiative for Families and Youth, TIFI, Coalition uh, will also have a presentation. Then we'll open it up to public comment. Um, I want to note that our committee will not be deliberating on the zoning ordinances or the local option tax that are before the council. They were not referred to this committee and they're not on our agenda. Um, directly after our public forum, there, there will be the legislative matters meeting and they will be taking up the four zoning ordinances. Um, and that starts at seven. 
the local option tax will be uh, deliberated in the finance committee which meets within the city council meeting so that's seven o'clock this thursday march 1st this is more of a general forum on this new retail industry um, you're welcome to comment on any aspect that you'd like but i just want to explain that we won't be delivering on those four proposals that are before the council uh, if there's time to have some discussion after everyone's had a chance to speak we will try and do that We'll be listening to all your questions and concerns and um, and we'll be noting them. I encourage you to go to the other, to go to the zoning conversation at seven, to go to council and um, and talk at those meetings too and um, ex explain your, your thoughts on this matter. Um, and I'm gonna ask that you try and keep your comments to three minutes. Uh, hopefully we'll, that'll allow everyone to speak before we have to adjourn at seven. Um, if we can't get to everyone, I'm going to try, I will stay for legislative matters um, and we'll listen to, hopefully be able to hear your opinion there. Um, you can always email us your thoughts as well. Um, and uh, as always, we ask for civility and respect to all participants, although you may say what you like about us because we're public figures. <laughs> so with that, um, we will start with our first presentation, which is the Board of Health. Thank you. Thank you for giving me that time to speak. I'm Joanne Levin. I'm the chair of the Board of Health uh, in Northampton. And um, I just want to say that with um, marijuana being a new business, we have the opportunity to sort of get it right from the beginning, as opposed to things like cigarettes, which were everywhere and had to be sort of reeled in over, over many years. Um, um, so I just want to make my comments in two sections. The first section is something that I think you said you didn't want to address, but, it, but as the city council, the other city councilors are here, uh, that the issues around zoning, I think, are urgent because they have to be submitted by, got to be done by April 1st. So if, if there are zoning issues, which I did not see um, listed in the current zoning um, uh, proposals, um, someone needs to move on these and that's the question about caps on the number of establishments i know because we're a city that um, um, had a majority of people who wanted uh, marijuana to be legalized we have a certain number of establishments i think our number comes out to like 4.3 so a certain percentage of the alcohol establishments um, but i think we have the liberty to decide that we don't want 10 pot shops on main street on day one um, and um, I think the Prevention Coalition and SPIFI will talk a little bit more about the data that they know about density, for example, around alcohol um, establishments. Um, and I'm not as well versed in that, so I'll leave that to them. Um, but, but I think we do have the option to limit the number of institutions um, or the density. And I think those are zoning issues where the time is up the essence. We want to do something about that. Um, and then the second category of things I want to talk about were about things that were either not addressed by the CCC uh, draft regulations or things that we as a city might decide we want to have control over. Um, and um, one thing that the CCC said was that all, in all retail shops, every, someone had to be 21 to enter. That's great, but there was um, uh, use about a, a multi-use shop, um, a mixed-use establishment, they called it, and it's not clear to me what that is, and they were not clear at all that people had to be 21 and over in order to go in. So is that a, it's not going to be a bar because they don't allow the sale of alcohol, but would it be a restaurant, would it be a t-shirt shop, would it be a toy store? I mean, is there some limit on what it could be and uh, we do, I think, want to make sure that that's a 21 and over establishment. Um, another issue that they did not address is mobile units. Uh, my understanding is we do not allow food trucks downtown. Uh, do we want to allow pot trucks? Um, for an issue such as the Three County Fair or other issues that happen at the fairgrounds, there's lots of food trucks there. Do we want a pot truck? Well, could someone come up to the truck with their three-year-old in hand? And you know, how, how do we control sort of exposure to youth? Um, I think at the Three County Fair, there's a building where you have to have show your license to get in, and then you can drink alcohol. So whether we would want to have something more controlled like that rather than 
for mobile unit. I think that makes more sense to me. Do we want to have a way to have special permitting at Extravaganza? Do you want to have a pot truck? Well, do we have a way to do that? Um, uh, another thing that we'd like to see included uh, is Board of Health approved education at every point of sale. Um, we want to educate people about safe storage of their pot, um, uh, driving while under the influence. Uh, we want to make sure that people know our local rules and regs. Maybe we'll have tourists. Uh, to make sure educate people and make sure they use their pot safely. Um, and an issue that I think is less obvious that I feel pretty strongly about is about public smoking. And um, many of you are not old enough to remember this, but <laughs> I, when I was young, uh, cigarettes were everywhere. They were on primetime TV, people smoking, Johnny Carson. Um, they were um, on billboards, as for Marlboros. They were at uh, airports for smoky, smoky places. Um, and so it's been 50 or 60 years of public health work and lots of money to try to, try to clean up uh, and denormalize smoking. And we have non-smoking in bars and restaurants and in public places and in theory in our city parks. Um, and that's not uh, enforced currently, but I think there needs to be a discussion about whether we will permit public smoking of pot because when someone's smoking, you can't really tell what it is they're smoking. We gotta not allow cigarettes, but allow pot. I think normalization of smoking is not a good public health policy. Um, so um, these are issues, it sounds to me like we need a city ordinance to catch up on the things that the CCC did not, did not include or that we want to have local control over. And I don't know how to go about starting that. But I do offer to you the assistance of our director of health, um, Meredith O'Leary. And there's also um, a lawyer who works for the boards of health. She's um, a lawyer at the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards and the HD. Very, very smart, well-versed in how to write this language and what her public health recommendations would be. Um, so our goal is to offer adult use marijuana in our city safely, safely for our youth, for our visitors, not changing or, or um, disturbing the character of our downtown and making sure it's uh, um, preserving the economic health of our, of our downtown. So I offer you whatever help you can get. Thank you. Um, so next we have a presentation from Netta. So um, we're going to do this as a team. So I'm Leslie Rory, and many of you know me as the founder and the CEO of Tapestry Health for 40 years. But for the last three years, I've been really delighted to be the regional director for NETA and its director of patient services. And over those three years, I think we brought really cutting edge public health to Northampton. So as with the tradition of tapestry, I couldn't be more delighted with what NETA has brought to the city. So what I'm going to do is be that brief tonight spoken many other times. And what I'm going to do is to introduce two people. Uh, to my direct left is Amanda Rosatano. And Amanda is our Director of Operational Compliance. She also was the former Chief of Staff for Representative Smizek from Brooklyn. And Amanda was the one who really created all of our policies and procedures. And why we have run such an effective um, public health service. And to my real left is Kim Napoli. And Kim is an attorney, and she's the director of diversity with NETA. And um, she was honored to be selected to be on the advisory board to the CCC. So she'll be able to um, let you know firsthand, in a sense, what's happening there. So. I let my compatriots take it away. Thank you. Good evening, afternoon. 
Um, again, my name is Amanda Rossitano. I'm NETA's Director of Operational Compliance. Uh, I've been with NETA from almost the, the beginning before we even opened here in Northampton and, and as Leslie said, helped to sort of develop the, the way that we uh, operate, how we do business, our policies and procedures. Um, I was asked to speak a little bit about the implementation of the medical marijuana uh, regulations um, here in Northampton and, and through our NETA facility. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, the medical marijuana program was established as a result of a ballot question three in 2012 in Northampton. You know, I, I believe the number was about 75% of its residents supported that, and as you know, now have, have uh, largely supported legalization as well. Um, through that ballot initiative was the draft uh, was the regulations 105 CMR 725, which we are subject to um, today. Those regulations are really uh, the, at the core of how we operate as a business. Um, so NETA was actually um, among the first group of dispensaries um, uh, applicants in Massachusetts, and we are proud to say that we received the highest application score in that pro process um, from all of the fully approved first group of provisional licensees. Um, we're a mission-based organization. Um, we work to improve the health and well-being of Massachusetts registered medical marijuana patients. Um, we are serving approximately 11,000, oh, a little over 11,000 unique patients uh, at NEDA Northampton each year. Um, there really, you know, isn't really a stereotype when it comes to the medical marijuana patient. Um, our patients are very diverse in age, in race, in ethnicity, in occupation, medical conditions. Um, our youngest patient is just four years old in Northampton. Um, our oldest patient is 98. Um, I believe our oldest patient in our Brookline location is 102. So you know we really see a, a very wide range of, of, of ages. Um, the average age of our patients is 48. Um, and honestly, it's just been a really remarkable experience to see how many people um, and how many different conditions uh, we've been able to help um, by our services and our products. Um, our, t our team is comprised of a, a very diverse group of individuals that, uh, that bring really re unique experience um, and perspective to our organization. You know, we have Leslie Laurie here, who, as you all know, is really a pioneer in public health uh, in Western Mass and, and, and really beyond. Um, one of our founders uh, was uh, one of the first dispensary operators in Colorado and um, the head of the Colorado Industry Association. Um, our other founder comes from the business world and really brings a breadth of um, uh, business development experience that has allowed us to operate in a way that has been very professional, comprehensive, collaborative. Um, you know, we also have expertise in government, public policy, science, technology. So, you know, it, it's sort of that diversity of our team that allows us sort of the expertise to do what we do the way that we do it. Um, we, Meta Northampton was, was actually the second dispensary that was licensed in Massachusetts, second to open. Um, we were proud to have uh, the mayor and chief of police celebrate that occasion with us. Um, and, and really, we're proud of the reputation and the relationships that we've built with the community. Um, all of our products are grown or man gr grown and manufactured in Franklin, Mass, at our cultivation facility. Um, and we also have a dispensary in Brookline, Massachusetts. So we are a three-facility organization. We produce over 130 treatment options at our state-of-the-art facility in Franklin. Um, that facility houses a full commercial kitchen, as well as some of the most innovative techniques in product development. Um, you know, we are proud to say that we do have the, the, the most innovative products in the industry right now. Um, and part of the reason is because we have a whole research and development arm of our organization, uh, Molecular Infusions, which is really focusing on some advanced um, uh, product developments to really sort of tailor to the medical market. Um, we currently employ about 300 employees, and about 60 of those employees are here in Northampton. Um, and we are cultivating a very broad variety of strains uh, and products to be able to help patients with a variety of different conditions. So, you know, we make products such as tinctures and lotions and capsules that really allow for a uh, 
different types of uh, preferences for different people in different conditions. Um, and then we have Medicare's, which is our philanthropic, philanthropic arm of Meta. Um, and really this is expanding on our mission of improving lives and making a difference uh, here in Massachusetts. Through the Medicare's initiatives, um, our staff and our team are able to participate and advocate for a number of different important and significant causes. Um, we're really proud of some of the work that we've be able, been able to do with organizations here in Western Mass and in Northampton. And actually, Leslie has a handout here that, that highlights some of that work that we've done that she's going to pass around. Um, so uh, just briefly, um, you know, in terms of implementation through the state licensing process, we were we worked very closely with the city, uh, as you you probably are aware, to really ensure a smooth rollout um, and to make sure that any concerns uh, that people had were were appropriately addressed. Um, you know, we continue to build on those relationships um, and and are eager to continue to collaborate with the town through the the next uh, phase of our organization. Um, we pride ourselves on our organizational values of operational compliance, responsibility, and doing the right thing. Um, this is really sort of the core of how we make decisions at NETA, operational compliance being number one. Um, as Leslie mentioned, um, as those medical marijuana regulations were promulgated, um, I was responsible for crafting a set of comprehensive policies and procedures that essentially you know, took a look at those regulations and said, okay, how are we going to make sure that we have you know, every single detail of how we're going to do things to make sure that we're always remaining compliant with these regulations. Um, really, the core of the regulations is, is about safety and security. Safety and security of patients, of staff, and of the general public um, at large. Um, so, you know, these are, are of utmost importance to NETA. We don't spare any expense when it comes to safety and security. Um, our facility includes on-site security staff, um, very comprehensive entry procedures. Um, only patients are authorized to enter our facility at this point in time. Um, very extensive surveillance coverage. You know, we've been able to work with uh, the police departments and, and the municipalities that we work in to provide um, surveillance uh, when it's necessary of things that happen outside of our facilities, if we're able to catch that on camera. Specifically, that's been the case in Brooklyn where the police department has been able to rely on our surveillance to solve other crimes, um, which we've been really happy to help with. Um, education is really at the core of what we do at Meta. Um, we are uh, making sure that our staff is, is very well trained in order to be able to provide the right type of education to the patients that we serve. Um, education around safe storage, education around proper dosing, education around responsible use, different modalities, different uh, types and strains of cannabis that might benefit the patient. Um, and that education process is a continual process with our staff and the patients that we serve and also the people in the community. Um, product quality is, is really central to what we are doing um, and really a, po a, a point of close oversight by our regulators. All of our products are produced in-house in Franklin, and they have to pass extensive uh, third-party independent lab testing prior to being sold to any patient. So those, that testing ensures that those products are free from any contaminants um, that could be otherwise found. Um, we work very, very closely with the Department of Public Health. Uh, you know, we see them as a partner uh, it, through this program. And um, we are subject to regular unannounced inspections at all of our facilities. You know, through these inspections, you know, we've really established a solid track record of compliance. Um, we think that the, you know, the, the department has been very pleased with, with our um, operation and really often relies on us for input in terms of you know, how to make the program even better than it already is. Um, you know, that, that was reflected in a recent change to the regulation, the medical marijuana regulations that resulted from a, 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 a lot of input from dispensaries, including NETA, as to how to make these regulations even stronger than they already are. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but to wrap up, you know, we're really very proud of what we've been able to accomplish here in Northampton. Um, we really look forward to continuing to work closely with the town as the recreational process rolls out. 
um, you know, just like we did with medical, we want to make sure that we're partnering with you to address any concerns um, as, as that program is implemented. So briefly, I'll turn to Kim to just talk a little bit about those new uh, recreational regulations, and we're happy to answer any questions um, that you guys might have. Thank you so much. Um, as my colleague Leslie mentioned, I am a Cannabis Advisory Board member, in addition to being the Director of Diversity Programs at New England Treatment Access. Um, in my role as an Advisory Board member, I've had a direct opportunity to work with the CCC and other Advisory Board members to come up with recommendations for the regulations for the adult use market. Um, so as it pertains to NETA and going forward, NETA does intend to convert to a um, an adult use establishment as well as maintain its medical status. Um, as far as the regulatory lay of the land, the DPH currently has oversight over the regulations that address RMDs. Uh, the CCC is scheduled to, or at least must, must by the end of December of this year, subsume the DPH's role and take over the medical regulations. Um, it's likely that they will assume, assume what regulations are already existing for uh, for dispensaries, but they may actually alter them to some degree. Regardless of what they choose to do, what they, they may take some things away, they may add other things. Um, NETA intends to be as compliant as it always has been and continue to be a leader in the market in this respect. Um, with, the, with the regard to the lack of certainty and clarity on some things that um, the lady from the Board of Health mentioned, that uh, you know we we don't intend to engage in social consumption or home delivery, et cetera. So those things are not on our radar. However, we can be helpful in offering uh, any expertise available to us, as we do have members from Colorado, where these things are also slated to happen. Um, you know, it's it's there really is a lot <coughs> coming down the pike as far as adult use goes. However, Netta always intends to stay true to its um, its mission statement and to be a, a, comp a compliance partner and a leader in the industry. Um, the patients have always come first for us and they will continue to come first. We will always have a reserve for patients available at NETA. Um, you know, it, it's, it's important for, for patients to have continued access regardless of what the law says. I think anything that the regulation said as far as um, control and, and uh, the way the dispensaries are set to operate will be the floor for us and we will endeavor to continue doing more and uh, as we always have. If there's any questions you have about the regulatory process as it currently is or as it unfolds, you can feel free to contact <coughs> me directly or any one of us would be happy to give you guys what I need for help. Thank you. <coughs> okay, and um, next we have uh, New Hampton Prevention Coalition. Mm -hmm. um, and then followed by Spiffy or in okay. tandem. Yeah, we can talk to you next. Okay. Is our presentation available? Just because we have visuals. Oh, and a timer. Good. <laughs> that's, not, that's for later. Well, thanks for giving us some time to address this. Um, my name is Ananda Lennox. I'm the coordinator for the Northampton Prevention Coalition, which is a small substance abuse prevention coalition focused on delaying and reducing teen use rates for the city of Northampton. Um, I also have Caitlin Jobson, our youth engagement coordinator, and Karen Jarvis Vance is our director. Um, do I have the ability to advance the slides? Yes. With the um, mouse? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to get into some things that we're hoping to see Northampton adopt to just help reduce youth exposure. Um, but I always like to start off, um, hopefully people can read this, but the reason we care has all to do about youth development. Um, I've really been pleased with seeing how the CCC has really distinguished the difference between adult use and youth use. Because for us, like we are living in a community where people have predominantly wanted to vote this in, so the sale is going to come. So as we're seeing it unfold, as the public health official mentioned earlier, we just want to see it done right from the start. So that for one, like even for business considerations, as they're coming in, they know it's a lot to expect and won't have to jump through hoops later. And for youth and just enforcement, it'll make it easier to, across the board, parent these youth and also communicate with them clearly why we don't want them using and policies in place that will help reduce that risk. So anyhow, the brain develops until about the age of 25. Um, a lot of research has shown that addiction is primarily a developmental disease. You know, so this is the age where they're most likely to develop an addiction if they're exposed to things young. And we've seen a, an increase over the years of um, 
case going in for treatment for dependency and addiction issues with marijuana, which before is pretty much seen as a more benign drug that you don't get addicted to. But at younger ages, addiction is addiction. Um, the other reason that we care, of course, is just academic success. Alcohol and marijuana both impact grades for our students, especially if they're <coughs> regular users. Maybe you have more than three, no, three minutes. Five, five. Okay. <laughs> so what I'm going to go over, well, Heather has a lot more information, so I'm also going to be particular to be quick for her. Well, in that case, maybe you do have three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I talk slow. So what I want to go over briefly is we do what's called the prevention needs assessment every two years, and Spiffy actually orchestrates this for Hampshire County. Northampton, what we do is we go in and we survey 8th, 10th, and 12th graders at JFK, Northampton High School, and Smith Vocational High School. For tonight's presentation, I didn't include Smith Vocational, so we're just looking at Northampton and JFK. And we surveyed 470 students. It's an opt-in, it's an opt-out process, so the students are given the surveys. If they don't want to take it, they don't have to, but a lot of them do. And um, there's a lot of things within the survey that collect information about substance use, but also school climate connection to family and a lot of risk and protective factors that can contribute to academic success or um, substance abuse and stuff like that. So what you're looking at here is we have two measures of substance use. We have lifetime use, like have you ever tried something? And then we have what's called 30-day substance use, which is how we regular what's called like regular use or regular user. And so as you can see, there's a lot of heavy hitters up here, but there's always two front runners and it's alcohol and marijuana. Cigarettes have dropped down significantly, which is great, but we're keeping an eye on vaping because that seems to be the new replacement <coughs> thing for nicotine delivery. And what I wanted to point out on this slide is that this is the first time um, probably in the last 10 years that marijuana use rates have gotten as close to alcohol. It used to always be that alcohol was the front runner. And I think there was some speculation that when marijuana became more socially acceptable that maybe we'd see alcohol rates drop and marijuana would increase as a, like an alternative. But they're teens, so they just were like, cool, now there's two things that we can use. <laughs> um, so not to minimize the impact, but all right. There we go. Oops. Can I go back? I believe so. Um, no, right click doesn't do it. Could somebody go back for me? <laughs> Page up. It's two to the And one more. <coughs> Awesome, thank you so much. All right, so I have notes on this one. Um, I just wanted to let people know what students are reporting right now. So we look at trend data for everything that we survey, um, whether it's prescription drugs, Adderall, opioids. And so since we're talking about marijuana tonight, I just wanted to showcase what we've seen. So um, decrim happened in about 2008, and then medical marijuana became legal in 2012. And then recreational marijuana became legal, though not for sale yet, in 2016. Um, what we've seen, and this is you know, in light of prevention efforts and education policies and all sorts of things that we try to work at, but we have seen little upticks. And the senior class is the one that we're most concerned about, which kind of makes sense. Seniors have a lot more freedom. They see themselves as adults, even though they're not 21. So when we're looking at policies for the city around sales, we're kind of looking at that age group in particular. Um, but what we've seen is that there's little upticks every time a substance becomes a little bit more acceptable in our community, so we've been tracking that. The other thing that we look at, um, a little delay, is how students are consuming marijuana. When we asked this question, you know, 10 years ago, it was mostly smoking, um, but now there's, it's just a lot easier to get information um, through YouTube and all sorts of other things on different ways that you can consume it. And one of the concerns we have with um, these different consumption methods has to do with the concentration of THC. So especially like when we look at developmental brain diseases and stuff like that, there's a heightened risk if you're getting exposed to much higher concentrations of THC. So the majority of students are still smoking it. Um, there's a growing number that are eating it. Very few are drinking it. Vaping is a growing thing. <coughs> oh, shoot, that's my phone. <laughs> um, and then dabbing, which is, um, that's one of the more highly concentrated forms for the make shot and stuff like that, is growing in popularity as well. And this is for 30 day use. Um, the other thing that we notice in public health, and this is not special just to marijuana, it's just any substance, is that when the perception of harm drops, like when students, like students are risk takers to a certain extent, but they're not suicidal. 
So when a drug becomes more seen as less harmful, what we see is that use rates do increase. And so if you look at 2017 in particular for our senior class, the use rates, you know, 23% when asked, like, do you think that there's great harm in using marijuana? Only 23% think that's true. And the corresponding use rates is now up to 51.8%. So I just wanted to point out that that's one of the things that we're looking at when we talk about how to educate the youth is like, we don't want to demonize a drug, but we also don't want to make it seem so harmless that it's, they think it's okay for them to use. Um, so the last thing I want to get into are just some policies that can help youth reduce youth rate. We don't have a lot of research on marijuana because there aren't that many establishments right now, but what we do have is things like on outlet density and tobacco reg regulations and stuff like that. So the things that we've seen have helped in those industries are capping outlet density like they do with tobacco and alcohol retailers. Um, upholding state workplace safety laws regarding public smoking and make the laws enforceable. Um, I think the public health representative had mentioned that it is kind of hard in the city to, like you can put signage up, but I think what we rely on a lot is just more social policing and social norming around it's not acceptable to use this year. And as far as like youth exposure and making um, the enforcement have teeth, um, it avoids hypocrisy, which teenagers are very, very, very um, quick to pick up on. Um, and then, the other thing, I, um, this was the best I could come up with in this time notice, but for outlet density, I just did a quick Google search so I didn't have to drown in paperwork, and it brought up like a whole host of like sites that just have different um, you know, research um, articles on how outlet density affects not only use rates, but other social things, like whether it be appropriate supervision and stuff like that. And then to the right is a list of all the different organizations that are in support about the density capping. Um, but again, there's nothing out there right now for marijuana capping, but I just wanted to show the examples of what we do know in regards to alcohol. Um, so right now, public smoking and consumption is not allowed per the Cannabis Control Commission's regulations. Um, but right now, Northampton currently has no true means of enforcing that regulation. Like, I remember when I had a conversation with Jody Casper, she was saying that right now, like for underage possession, they can cite them and give them a ticket, but there's really no agency that's able to enforce it or oversees it. So she said there's some do-gooders that go ahead and pay the ticket, but for the most part, they just get tossed and there's really no way to do it. And so from a teen's perspective, they're like, well, they say I'm not supposed to do it, but nobody's really doing anything about it. So we wanted to see if we could avoid that with these retail sales. Um, and local control allowing enforcement is encouraged to reduce youth exposure and the culture of promoting use. Um, the last, I think this is my last thing, so the CCC regulations um, are really clear about this being adult use only, which we're fully in support of. The one area that seemed a little bit squirrely was, um, well, obviously medical sales were an exception, 18 and older for that. But for the mixed use shops, like I'm not sure what to expect with that. And so since youth exposure does increase like their perception that it's an okay thing to do, even if you talk to them ad nauseum about how it's not, um, it would be great if we could maybe prevent things like um, record shops having pot available too, like anything that would kind of create a culture where it's really attractive to them and maybe um, making a little, like, just a fine line between making it subversive and really attractive and also just really, really clear that this is something they shouldn't do. Um, uh, this is just a quick slide showing what our priorities are based on what students use. So when we survey, we, we basically focus most of our efforts on the heavy hitting substances. So for youth, it's always been alcohol, marijuana, and prescription drugs. Um, our various targets are students, families, schools, and community, and at the bottom are just various um, thing, programming that we put in place to help try to stem the tide of adult use, I mean, youth use. Um, and this is just all the different ways that you could follow us. Um, we love having a fan base. Like, substance abuse is not the sexiest of professions, but we do good work, <laughs> and it's nice to have people on our side, and um, I'm going to let Heather take over from here. But thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Hi, so my name is Heather Warner and I coordinate the Spiffy Coalition and we're um, very similar to Northampton Prevention Coalition except that we're countywide and we do collect data um, throughout the county. We survey over 3,000 students every two years and we've been doing so for the past like, well, I don't know, 10, 10 plus years. So we have some pretty interesting trend data. Um, we ask a lot of questions about marijuana, and I have a, a two-page handout that shows some of the data. Um, we asked, for example, in addition to what Ananda shared, um, questions about you know, what are some of the 
problems you've experienced from your marijuana use, um, which um, about 40% of students say they have coughing and breathing problems. We also ask about um, you know, doing poorly at school and, and some other things. Um, let's see, so we collect data. Um, we, we work with all sectors of the community and we create a culture where youth are supported to make healthy choices. Uh-oh, how do I click this now? Right click, left click, okay. Oh, that's all right. I was going to skip that one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's okay. We, we use a, a strategic prevention framework when we um, do all of our, you know, which means that we, we use evidence-based practices, we collect data, we, we build coalitions, we um, engage in a planning, you know, a formal planning process so that we know that we're actually implementing things in the community that make sense and that will actually address some of the problems and draw on the resources and assets in our community. And then we revisit that all the time because everything's changing. And the other um, thing that I had up there was a public health framework for legal marijuana. And um, that was developed uh, by the Department of Public Health in Colorado. And theirs is a similar approach. Um, they, they talk about assessment, but they also talk about policy development, um, enforcement, and assurance, as they call it, which is um, you know ensuring a competent work force and, um, and evaluating and adjusting to community needs. Um, so I also, like the Board of Health, I actually um, started in public health at the Holyoke Board of Health, and um, I was the tobacco control director there um, in 1990 something, <laughs> and I, we were, I actually wrote the tobacco regulations for the city, and we were the first city in the state to have smoke-free restaurants. And um, it was, you know, it was an interesting time, and you know, and of course, of the board of health members, this was new to them. They they weren't really sure that tobacco regulation was something that fell under their, you know, control, and um, they were worried about businesses in Holyoke, um, in a poor community. But I mean, we can kind of see how far we've come with that, um, and how, you know, we can educate young people and adults up and down and up and down, but until we create a policy that shifts the norm, you know, we don't see such good results. And so again, um, you know, with, with alcohol in Massachusetts, we do a pretty good job. A lot of people say that the marijuana bill is regulated like alcohol. I disagree. Um, we, with the marijuana law bill, we don't have a three-tier system that separates, you know, the, the manufacturer from the um, wholesale to the retail. We um, don't have local control of licensing. Um, we don't have caps on the number of licenses permitted per capita. Um, the alcohol, you know, state alcohol regulations require that only six forms of state approved ID are accepted. And it's kind of important because Massachusetts has a very strong identification card that's hard to duplicate. But um, so far, at least in the regulations from the CCC, any federal, federally approved ID is accepted, which is a real departure from that, and, a, and a, I think a threat to youth access, because um, we know that high quality fakes um, are attainable. Um, and also there's no pricing controls as yet on marijuana as there are for alcohol. So I think the fact that this is not really regulated by like alcohol and that there isn't that local control is kind of gives all the more reason why at the local level, we need to pay attention. We need to be looking at this and um, understanding the, the, you know, what's in this, the bill and what, what's to come and what we can do to gain back as much local control as we can. Um, you know, again, like the board, of, let's see, I'm doing it again, said, let's get it right from the start. And in fact, Col uh, California has a website called Getting It Right From The Start. And they've done a lot of webinars that are available on that site. Um, and they have some really interesting ideas about equity and social justice, um, and it's a it's it's you know really interesting things. I mean they um, anyway. Um, I'll keep moving. Um, so some of the ways that we can get it right, um, and my slides are a little boring from here. So some of the public health goals that we have in mind that would prevent youth mar use of marijuana. Um, you know, we collect baseline data, and states looking at that too. Um, 
We build social and emotional skills of young people through evidence-based health curriculum. Northampton High School uses the All-Stars program. We try to delay the age of initiation. Um, the longer we can delay, the less likely someone will become a habitual user um, or a problem user. Um, we want to educate about the risks to youth development, to brain development, and like Ananda was saying, you know, not have people believing it's completely risk-free, especially for youth. Um, and having effective policies that reduce access, um, both retail and social. We haven't done a great job with that with alcohol. Um, we are hard pressed to penalize people for providing alcohol to young people. Um, we want to limit exposure to adult use and limit exposure to products, marketing, and advertising. And one of the ways this can be done is through um, minimizing the caps, you know, the number of places that we have, especially in a downtown area um, where families may be congregating, and also the density. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I, and also then the enforcement. How do we, how do we effectively enforce some of the rules that we put in place? Um, and so taking a quick look at what are other communities doing, um, Amherst has put a cap uh, at eight retailers. Um, they've added zoning restrictions to include libraries, pharmacies, and other places. They've created a 300 foot buffer from the K through 12 uh, schools. And they've adopted their smoke free public use language as a bylaw of the town. Um, not just placing it in the Board of Health. And this allows the uh, more teeth, um, the bylaw to have more teeth and can be enforced more effectively. Um, in addition, they added to that language no public consumption of edibles. And we know that it's obviously hard to control for these things, just like open container with alcohol or, you know, um, no smoking in a park. But we also know that when the rule is there, many people abide by it, and it becomes a cultural norm. So, um, let's see. East Hampton um, has proposed a cap at nine at the latest information I got last night, um, and they're looking at limiting it to four for the first year, so they have a graduated thing. Their buffer um, ends up now at 350 feet, and they also imposed a buffer of 200 feet between retail outlets as the, in the most likely path of a pedestrian. So, I mean, that uh, uh, sort of talks to the density issue also, so that you don't have like a pot row on Main Street or something. Um, and I know this isn't for zoning, but it's like things that I feel like the general public like may want to hear about, you know. Um, they also looked at hours of operation and um, South Hadley at their town hall meeting um, voted to approve a November ballot to potentially ban um, marijuana altogether. And they've added many other zoning um, clauses. Grafton, which presented at a, a city, a statewide thing, so I know about them. They have some zoning and special permitting. Actually, Amherst has special permitting too. And that's one way um, that what through zoning permits and through special permits, we can potentially regain a little bit more control because right now, if a, if a retail establishment is in violation of you know, repeated offenses of serving to minors or you know, something like that, we don't really have any control over that in a, at the local level. We can report it to the state and hope that something happens there, but the on the ground eyes and you know whatever um, of enforcers and, and we don't even know actually whether local authorities can enforce or do compliance checks of underage sales at this point. So that's still something to find out. But for any violation, it's like it's good to have some of that local control over the permitting. Um, so, and other towns are also having a lot of working groups that have formed, um, a point person for all of this work, and public forums that started a long time you know, prior to Northampton. Um, so I guess I encourage our city, my city, to go slow and get it right for everyone. I think the mistakes that we can make from the onset are also potentially harmful for the retailers. We don't need to have them come in only to later just have not thought it through and say, we don't really want that to happen. I'm sorry that you wasted this much money investing in this type of shop when that's not what we're going to accept in this community. 
you know, again, the reason we need that public input. Um, we need political transparency. How are decisions being made to regulate or not regulate in this community? There haven't been a lot of proposals yet um, that I've seen from other communities. Um, I think we need to consider public health implications for all decisions that are being made and include public health professionals in the decision-making process. And um, we need to do what we can uh, before April 1st because that's when what applications go in and they're going to assume that any retail space is available for a pot shop unless we say otherwise in our community. Um, so there are a few very specific things that Northampton could do as well. Um, and this is my last slide. Um, so we, we should assert that local control where possible. We can also dedicate funding um, from the revenue for drug prevention, education, and enforcement. We can look at caps and density, special permits, and strong host agreements, um, advertising restrictions. Um, we can look at regulation um, for public use, home grow safety, and odor nuisance bylaws. Um, and again, we can adopt that ordinance for public use. Um, we also may want to have rules about paraphernalia, or as they're called in the CCC regulations, accessories. Um, I don't know what shops we want those to be, you know, or whether there's some way that we can regulate how those are um, distributed and sold. Um, and then setting up enforcement systems, you know, like Ananda said, how do we, how do we effectively enforce some of this stuff that hasn't been effectively enforced through decriminalization? I think that's all I have. So. I'm also available. Um, I've got my, my copy of the regulations that I go through, and I have all our data, and I'd love to just be a resource as this process unfolds. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you everyone for those presentations. Um, so we're going to begin public comment. I don't know if people signed up for public comment. Um, if not, that's fine. People can just raise their, no one signed up? Um, people can just raise their hands, and I will call on you. Um, again, as uh, we have a lot of people here and have to adjourn before seven, so um, if you can try and keep it to three minutes, there's a timer, I would appreciate it. Um, so who would like to speak? Oh, and please state your name and your address. Absolutely. So my name is Angela Cheek. I live in Florence, on 15 Crest Street Drive. Um, I am a resident of Northampton for 12 years. I'm a mother of two teenagers, and I'm also the head of the dispensary of Northampton. Um, I just wanted to just mention and say how proud I am of being part of this organization. Having navigated these waters with teenagers has already been a priority of mine to make sure that they're safe and that they're educated on what this medicine does. Currently, we are still medical, um, and to me, that's been a really amazing journey. Um, I have a medical condition. This is how I got introduced to marijuana in the first place. Um, this has really changed my life. I've been able to come off opioids. I was on them for many years. And my children saw that journey. They saw what happened between opioids and they saw the difference in mom when mom started using marijuana. Um, I've had this discussion with my kids since they were small. We've had no trouble with it at my house because I've been very open with them. Um, it's a priority of not just Meta, but also mine, to be absolutely certain that um, youth access is as guarded as we possibly can. I don't believe that um, marijuana is appropriate for younger, younger children. I don't think, I agree entirely, I don't believe that this is something that they should have. Right now, part of my job is to make sure that nobody can access New, uh, New England treatment access without their ID and also their medical card. I've worked with parents of small children. Um, I've worked with parents of teenagers who also have their cards to make sure that their children are getting safe access to the medicine that they need. Um, I've seen the result of using this with seizure disorder. I've seen the result of using it with anxiety for teenagers. It's been a pretty remarkable thing in the correct dispensing area. So using it for a medicinal purpose has been really remarkable. Um, I'm proud of NEVA. I'm proud of the way we're handling things. I'm proud of the way that we're moving forward towards adult use. Um, my job right now is to ensure that it's done as compliantly as possible. I follow the direction of these women right here who help me lead this team. I have a team of 60 people that I lead every day to make sure that they're educated, they know what they're talking about, and they're giving safe access to their own patients. It's, it's vital at Meta that we can continue to leave this and make sure that our patients are, are cared for, even, even in adult use and as we go forward. Um, 
you know, I just wanted to say I'm really proud of what we do. I'm happy to answer any questions. I love being in Northampton. It's been a really welcoming environment, and I'm committed to making sure that the youth um, is protected against whatever's coming next. Thank you. Yes, please. Good evening. I'm Cynthia Swopis. I live at 120 Coles Mountain Road, and I'm also a member of the Board of Health. And I want to thank you all, this subcommittee and the entire city council, for taking the very first step um, as we um, move toward implementing um, this exciting time in Northampton. I want to um, highlight Dr. Levin, our chair of the Board of Health, comments. I think we have an opportunity to distinguish ourselves in the Commonwealth by building a series of policies and practices and processes that reflect not only the progressiveness of our community, but also our focus that we continue to have for, for years on health and safety. So um, I think this opportunity is something that we can really take. And um, if I were sitting where you're sitting, I would be feeling like, oh my god, how are we going to do this? So I commend you. Um, I have a couple of things that, to consider very briefly. Um, once again, the number of cannabis establishments that we are going to allow, permit, in our community and where they're going to be. It's a great opportunity for us to have that discussion. Um, secondly, how are we going to address the um, recreational use in public? Amherst put in something about edibles, but how are we going to do it? We don't have to copy Amherst. Um, I teach at UMass, so I think eight establishments at UMass are in Amherst, that's gonna be interesting. Um, who will be responsible for enforcement and how are we gonna do it? I mean, this is really, really pretty uh, tricky. And then finally, how are we going to educate and involve our businesses, our citizens, our kids, um, and um, on the impact of cannabis use and misuse? I think we have opportunities there. And so again, thank you very, very much for holding this forum so that we can hear everybody's perspective. Yes, please, we're back. Good evening. My name is Dick Evans. I'm a lawyer in Northampton. I was the uh, chair of the SO4 campaign, and I've been uh, supporting the uh, legalization and the normalization of cannabis for a long time. A couple of uh, miscellaneous points. Uh, first of all, one of the speakers pointed out that, that we, that the cities and towns have no control over the, the industry. And, and uh, one often hears the term, the new industry. I, I point out that it's not really a new industry, it's a very old industry. We have a new way of dealing with this industry. Rather than leaving it to the black market and to the underground, we are imposing regulations and controls on this new market. That's what's new about marijuana, it's the way we control it, not marijuana itself. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, initiative that was passed by the voters and as ratified by the legis legislature last summer uh, expressly imposes a lot of authority on the part of cities and towns to control the industry. In fact, it, it grants the uh, municipalities the authority to regulate the time, place, and manner of marijuana, licensed marijuana operations. And that's a very big, very broad grant of authority. Uh, to suggest that the, the cities and towns have no control, this is simply false. I heard the term evidence-based a lot, and I support the notion of evidence-based, and I urge this committee, as you consider the, the revised zoning laws, to look at the hard evidence. What is, in fact, the hard evidence as to the impact of legal marijuana on the public health, the public safety, and the character of the community? I suggest that you'll find very little if you look at the experience in Colorado and Oregon and the other states that have been through this, and most especially if you look at the, I think it's now 20 or so municipalities in Massachusetts that have medical uh, dispensaries. I know that some of the folks in East Hampton uh, reached out to a number of those cities and asked them directly, what has been your experience with, with uh, medical marijuana? What's been the impact on the public health and public safety and care of the community? They got no negative responses back. So if you've not done that, I suggest that's something this committee may, may wish to do. Let me mention too that we're considering zoning laws here. Zoning laws are laws that regulate our use of land. We're not here to litigate 
the or relitigate the question of whether marijuana should be legal. The voters have spoken on that subject. We're here today to talk about how Northampton's zoning laws should be revised, if at all, to protect the public health, public safety, and the character of the community with regard to the uh, to cannabis commerce. Uh, there, there will be, as one of the speakers mentioned, a merger of medical marijuana and non-medical marijuana that will occur at the end of this year when the CCC takes over the supervision of the medical program in its entirety. And uh, I would urge the, the, this committee, uh, I'm not sure exactly what your approach is, but, but uh, I know a lot of cities and towns that have medical marijuana laws, they're repealing them in their entirety and replacing them with general laws that, that cover both medical and medical. And I, and I think the concept of medical marijuana is going to be obsolete in a couple of years. Um, it, it, was, it was new several years ago when, when we needed a term to distinguish non-medical from medical. We're not going to need that term in a few years when it's all merged. So, and I would strongly urge you not to, to incorporate the term recreational into the bylaw. That's, that's slang. It's uh, uh, conversational language, but there's, the term recreational doesn't appear in the statute, nor does it appear in the, the, uh, the CCC regulations. And so I would urge you not to adopt that, that term. Um, you can wrap up your thoughts. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And let me just mention, too, that, that with regard to actual regulation of marijuana establishments, the heavy lifting is being handled by the CCC itself. Uh, which, and there, there's not any uh, 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 responsibility imposed on, on the, the city. Uh, but you do have the right to exercise further control, not only through your zoning, but also through the, the host agreement, which should cover all the bases. So I, I, I applaud you for taking these steps. I urge you to fold this new industry into our existing mainstream economic commerce in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Laurie Loisel. I live at 46 Grand Avenue. And I just wanted to refer back to something Heather said about, and then something that Attorney Evans referred to, which is that yes, Communities have the ability to take some control, but if communities don't take that control, then they won't. So I think Heather's saying, do something. Don't just wait for the regulations from the Cannabis Control Commission. Do what's in your power to do to minimize the potential harm to youth, because the more uh, common something is, the more young people feel like it's something they can do. And um, I think that all Ananda and Heather are talking about is trying to mitigate the um, possibility that young people will start feeling like it isn't harmful. Because if they start feeling like it isn't harmful, they'll start using it. And it is, it is damaging to the developing brain. So I hope that um, our city council can, can do something because I feel like the mayor kind of like threw up his hands and doesn't want to do anything. I think that's the right course here. Thanks. Who else would like to speak? Anybody? No. Okay. Well, if you change your mind, feel free to let me know. Um, that actually leaves us with a good amount of time. So um, I would ask the committee. We have a wealth of knowledge here in this room and different experiences. Um, if there are questions um, that we have for some of the people that are here. Councilor Nash. Yeah, so I, I heard a number of people talk about um, safe storage. I've heard it, uh, concern f uh, from the prevention folks, and I've heard about how um, that is uh, that people at the who go to NETA are also counseled on how to do that. And I'm wondering if uh, the the, if the two sides have had a conversation around how that actually looks, because I don't know what that is, um, you know that you know I, I picture what a you know a gun safe looks like, or a liquor cabinet, you know, or or even a uh, a medicine cabinet that has some sort of lock on it. Um, so I would encourage that some sort of conversation about that, and um, uh, in terms of educating people. Um, Storage. Um, 
Um, I had a question for the folks at Netta, which what had to do with how do you, because um, you're, you're going to move to retail, how do you envision that um, things are going to change in the way that you're doing business currently? And, you know, with, you know on July 1st, what will look different? Does somebody want to speak to that? Yeah. Um, I think Netta, it's really important for people to hear that because yeah. that's kind of what... Right. What Netta is hoping to do is to actually open on July 1st if the regulations that the CCC provides are ones that we feel are reasonable, and so far that's the case. The kind of education that we do, a handbook that we give to everyone, individual counseling that we provide, we expect that to be the same. The only difference that we see is if there's adult use, that individual will pay if the city um, goes through with what we are also supportive of, is a 3% tax. The difference will be that of a tax for those who are adult use, and those who are medical will continue to get their medicine without a tax. The education, the careful security that we provide, and the, um, the third party laboratory testing of all of our products will continue. I think that's an answer. Thank you. I would add, I mean, so Please. to supplement Leslie, practically there will be no difference. Um, mm -hmm. It's the same standard of business that we've come, uh, come accustomed to and that you would have come to expect from us will continue on. Um, that very bright line difference being are you 21 years of age or older and buying with the sales tax or are you a patient? We plan to educate our patients or customers the same way as we always have. Um, so really there should be no difference whatsoever, just that are you paying a tax or are you not? Just one. Do you anticipate like a rush of? I mean, is it going to be like? Yeah, is well, it going to be like the pie bar or the casino opening up? I think. I think realistically, that depends on how many locations open up statewide. Um, you know, is there going to be other places that are licensed and able to dispense on day one? Um, and what is the appetite for folks here to come in and purchase uh, cannabis over the counter? Um, so, but. Yes, I would expect there to be more, more business and we'll certainly plan for that. Um, we have some apps on our website that will tell you whether there's a line or not. Um, you know, uh, we, again, we have that patient supply that we're guaranteeing, so patients won't be affected, uh, but we plan to do everything we can to prepare and uh, in advance of the sale date to have enough product to support the demand as best we can. And when we open medically, we work very, very closely with the chief of police and the police force to ensure that, because it was the same thing with medical, we had lines. And there were no issues in terms of public safety. And, and, and just to the point on safe storage, you know, a very important uh, aspect of the, reg of the regulations, both the medical and the recreational, is the requirement that all products leave uh, the dispensary in a child-proof container. Um, that you know the, that these packages do not resemble commercially available candy products. Um, so there are a lot of uh, you know uh, elements built into the regulations around you know safe storage and, and safe packaging and labeling as well. So just one. So following <laughs> up on that, which is that because another concern of the prevention folks is that this stuff that the edibles will or will be you know the. Kids are going to say, oh, it looks like a candy bar, or it looks like something delicious, which I would imagine in part of the marketing is you actually want it to look like it's something edible or delicious. Mm -hmm. And so um, what, are, there, are, are there methods of packaging that, that you guys take that would be good for them to hear? Or, or have you thought about that? Or, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so our, our packages, uh, you know, all of our packages are required to be plain opaque. Um, like I said, childproof. So if, I, if we, we do sell a chocolate bar, um, that chocolate bar is very clearly labeled um, uh, with, you know, that it is a marijuana infused product. product. Um, but that chocolate bar, I mean, we can't put a chocolate bar in a box that's childproof, but we do put it in an exit bag that is sealed and childproof. And that exit bag, you know, we counsel our patients to use that as, you know, 
as safe storage for this product. It, they are very, very difficult to open for people Anybody. who aren't children. <laughs> yes. um, so, so yeah, there are many, many measures that are already written into the regulations around responsible packaging, labeling, and the child-proof opaque containers um, that these products have to, to leave the dispensary in. And we've had to have, the, I mean, the Department of Public Health basically okays what the packaging yes. is. Uh, anytime we have a new product, that packaging gets reviewed by the Department of Public Health to ensure that it is uh, compliant. And we were actually happy, and I can say, in being a Western Mass chauvinist, that um, <laughs> all of our design packaging for mm -hmm. all of NETA was actually done by a group in South Hadley. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Porter? Actually, can you come up to the podium? Just sure. There, the camera's over there, which is kind of... Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I appreciate, like, the, I really do appreciate the ideas, too, about talking about, um, you know, safe storage. And I know that the Board of Health has already proposed that, you know, there be some education, collaboration, you know, about the materials that might be required um, through the regulation that, you know, get distributed at um, retail stores. Um, you know, and I think the regulation even covers over an ounce it needs to be stored in a locked container, um, you know, which prevents some access and not others. Um, I also, the, you know, I think NETA is a wonderful, you know, concept and idea, and I don't know that every retailer coming into Northampton from anywhere that wants to and applies to open is, is going to be that conscientious. I'm not, I, I'm not confident about that. Um, I don't know that it's going to look like that. Um, we know that the regulations do limit, um, you know, certain types of edibles and, um, you know, and, and, and not have look-alike, um, like Pop-Tarts and all that kind of stuff that, you know, prevention people love to throw up there and show everybody. <laughs> but, you know, that isn't what I think is going to be allowed here. But it doesn't mean that there aren't products that will be attractive to youth or that marketing won't, you know, be young person oriented, um, you know, we, we really do need to be aware of that and be conscious of that. And not every place is going to have roots in Northampton and, um, and, and, uh, and the knowledge base that, that NETA has, you know, on the products. So, um, you know, and I think especially when we get into cafe type stuff, which we don't even have to go there right now because it's delayed, but I mean, you know, who's measuring what and you know who's trained to measure what and and who's you know leaving intoxicated and how do we measure that there's a lot of issues around some of that the consumption stuff too but yeah I just wanted to say um, you know I appreciate what you all are doing and I don't know that that's what it's going to look like everywhere Thank you. Um, uh, yeah I, I had a, a, a of course a question of public public use public smoking uh, as, as we've heard a lot about that um, and just with regard to tobacco, that's been an issue for a long time. And I was curious, and maybe this is for you, Dr. Levin, what the, what the status is within the Board of Health discussions about a public smoking ban, uh, regardless of the substance being, being, being smoked, or whoever could best Let me just that. offer that it, it is under the statute, it is illegal to consume in public, as far as smoking goes. That is not lawful, it's not lawful to consume marijuana. Um, and if you're going to have a social consumption establishment, that would need to be regulated by the CCC license and the safeguards that the town imposes as well. Yeah. So um, I understand, that, yeah, that it would be in the regulations. However, we currently have on the books, on our policy, a ban on public smoking in uh, municipal buildings and public parks. But you know, in Pulaski Park, people smoke cigarettes and people also smoke pot. So the question is when there's public, um, when there's retail pot, are we going to see <coughs> in public smoking and are we going to nip that in the bud and what, what do we want our downtown to look like? What do we want Pulaski Park to look like? What do we want our public, all other public parks to look like? And how do we want our downtown to look and what do we want to model for our youth? Um, so I think, you know, when people are smoking, uh, we're, right now we don't have anyone in enforcement, we have a sign a couple of signs. We have signs in our bus stops, but people still smoke in our bus stops. Um, and we don't have enforcement right now. And I think that if you're going to have people smoking cigarettes and people smoking pot more liberally, that this is probably the time to talk about more enforcement. Um, public smoking in general. So if I can just add to that. Hi. 
I'm Meredith O'Leary. I'm the public health director for the city of Northampton. So we have uh, tobacco regulations in the city of Northampton. And the way that we have defined smoking, it covers anything that's combustible. So if it's if you're vaping, it's an e-cigarette. If it's a, a, a regular cigarette, if it's a joint, what have you, it all falls under this definition of tobacco. And smoking is prohibited currently in all of our municipal-owned parks and recreation areas. When we included this in our regulation in 2014, we really thought hard about how we were going to enforce this. <coughs> At that time, we thought it could be a little bit of self-enforcing. People would, you know, if they knew it was an area where it was prohibited, the public would just ask, you know, could you kindly, kindly put that out? We would have signs everywhere. It's been pretty successful in most of our park and recreational areas, except for Pulaski Park. We get multiple complaints every single year about smoking in the park, even with our signs up there. The mayor has just put some new revamped signs out there. We talked about placement, hoping that can help. We put new signs at our bus stations. We perhaps may see a decrease in smoking in the areas, but it's not foolproof. Um, so the way that the regulation is written right now, if you can't smoke a cigarette, you can't smoke tobacco, So, uh, excuse me, uh, marijuana, so that's covered. We're currently having discussions about expanding where smoking is prohibited. We're talking about, we're looking at other communities and doing research on smoke-free downtowns because secondhand smoke is problematic. Um, so if we do end up amending our regulations to cover smoke-free downtown, again, that will be carried over to marijuana also. So that's what we have in the books today. Oh, enforcement. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's where I was coming around to. <laughs> Very tricky. I've had conversations both with the mayor and Chief, of, uh, Chief Casper, and we talked about what that could look like. Obviously, at the health department with one and a half full-time inspectors, we can't enforce smoking downtown or in park and recreation areas. So uh, Chief Casper has thought the only way, well, there's two ways. We could either hire someone to make this their full-time job, you know, add another position either to the PD or to the health department, or, you know, give the enforcement to the people who are already out there, to the police officers. Right now, if we include this in our, or it, as it is in our regulation, but if we expand the territory into our regulation, it's a non-criminal offense, so that means it's just a ticket. Chief Casper and I also discussed about maybe um, putting smoking, prohibiting smoking, making it a criminal offense like we do public consumption of alcohol. That really doesn't fit well, I don't think, with our community, but it's a discussion that we can have. But So there are discussions that are happening between departments and the mayor about enforcement, but I think it's a broader discussion that needs to be brought in to the conversation about adult use marijuana. Um, I, I did have a, 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 another question. Um, a lot of talk about caps and, and, and density and uh, what's been uh, tried in other communities. I'm, I'm just curious if coming out of our planning department, if, is, is, there any, is there any talk of any additional ordinance beyond those that have been proposed that would, that would address the, uh, the matter of uh, a, a cap or, or density of some sort? If you don't mind me putting um. you on the spot. <laughs> So I think the um, the mayor felt like it, so what what's in front of the city council are, are land use changes and a, and a cap you know I suppose some people could argue that could be considered a land use um, control but it's really more of a political decision so if someone if there was interest in putting a cap out there um, that could be a separate ordinance um, in terms of density density may work. Um, in big communities where you've got huge downtown areas um, but there are municipalities around the country that um, you know Oregon and and, um, and Colorado that have um, actually I think statutorily they have some requirements for density caps but when you're talking about you know one per every 100 feet or or three per 500 feet you're taking up a huge section of downtown already since the zip proposed zoning ordinance already is just focused on allowing retail in the commercial districts. So we have pretty small defined commercial districts. And it, um, so we felt that that, and, and also um, 
um, we felt that the total, um, that, it, that if there were an interest to do a cap, that that would be the way to look at minimizing the total number instead of dispersing them on the edges of um, the district. Yeah, I think what um, Carolyn just shared is kind of a good segue into what I wanted to ask about. Um, so there's a little bit of tension between the concept of evidence-based and what isn't really evidence-based. And um, I'm curious, I mean, we have places around the country that have had um, adult use or recreational or whatever term we're going to decide on using for a while now. And I'm, I was a little bit surprised that we didn't hear any kind of evidence that's been collected from those locations. What's worked, what's not worked, um, how use has increased, if um, their youth use has increased, those kinds of things. So I'm wondering if any of the experts in our audience can share lessons from the communities, the states where um, marijuana has been legalized for a while. I know, I'm putting you yeah. all on the spot. <laughs> there are studies out of Colorado uh, that would suggest that uh, teen Maybe you should, or, yeah, sure, sorry. Um, there are studies in Colorado uh, recently that suggest that teen use has not increased, but rather decreased. Um, and there's also, I mean, there's reasons for, for that, but I think there's reasons that you might see an increase in uh, some of the studies that were shown, um, not the least of which being the fact that it has become a topic of which people are much more comfortable talking about. Um, you, 10 years ago, people weren't, weren't gonna admit to smoking cannabis, um, whereas now people are voting for it and coming out to meetings and saying, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm this, I'm a mother, I want cannabis here. So I think there's, that's at least one reason for why you might see rates be different. Um, that of course isn't to suggest that people aren't just using it more. I think it can go either way, but what the studies are showing in other places is that it does not increase use amongst mm -hmm. teens. Um, if anything, it stays the same. I'd be happy to share that information with you. Um, if you want, I could send email to you. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I have another perspective oh, on um, that. Sorry, could uh, yeah. Mr. Evans uh, had oh, yeah. in uh, yeah, there is a lot of evidence from, from the other states. Uh, I would add to what Kim said that uh, in Colorado, there have been a number of studies that, that indicate that the property values in those neighborhoods that have cannabis establishments are actually increasing. <laughs> and that property crime in Denver has decreased since legalization. Those are two things. And I'm sure if you look, you'll find a lot more. Thank you. Ms. Marks. Um, well, I, I just wanted to mention that you need to look closely at some of the studies because um, there are a number of communities that haven't been studied, haven't been surveyed in, in Colorado, including those, you know, so if you look only at those communities that actually have pot shops or are selling retail marijuana and haven't banned it in their community, and you simply look at those, then you'll see that the youth rates have risen. And I can provide some evidence around that too. Um, and I think like, yeah, I'm gonna stop there, but I th there are a lot of research articles out there that look at lessons learned from Colorado and, and Washington, and you know, we can certainly talk more about that. A, a follow-up question though is, um, my understanding from studies, and I've heard um, partly from you and from some others that, that the, the um, evidence is a little bit skewed, that in uh, the places where marijuana has been legalized, the opioid use rate has gone down. Mm -hmm. And so that is cited as a real benefit of mm -hmm. legalizing um, yeah. marijuana. I mean, I use. think that we have to look at all of the you know, pros and cons. And I'm, I'm, you know, I think that there's a lot more research that needs to be done on marijuana. And, you know, and you know, I think there's a lot of uses for marijuana. Um, there's different camps of people who say, you know, sobriety is sobriety, and there's other people that say, yeah, this is a better option than that, and, um, you know, there's a question about whether those opioid use rates would be going down anyway. Um, you know, I think that we just really need to um, be cautious about um, fear about the opioid crisis and seeing this as some kind of real, you know, using that as a platform for, for all the other risks that we may be facing in a community, you know, from, from legal, you know, from bringing retail in. I, I know, 
you know, when at one of the public hearings, you know, one of the delivery people said they were really disappointed that, that guns were not allowed on the delivery vehicle because they felt it was so dangerous to be transporting the product that they felt that that, that was something they were advocating for in the new, you know, in a, in a revised regulation. So I think there's a lot of safety issues, there's a lot of things to consider here, and I just would be cautious about the opioid connection. You know, there's also, I mean, Dr. Poti talks about the connection of the receptors being kind of a similar receptor for um, marijuana and THC as, as opioid, and I don't know enough about that, but she actually makes a connection between early initiation of, of marijuana and opioid use. So. It, the, 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 the research isn't out yet. We don't have enough research to know. I can speak to that. Um, um, what I feel really proud about is um, close to 18 years ago, um, I was involved in bringing the needle exchange program to Northampton. And every year, over 100,000 needles are exchanged. So the opiate problem in Northampton and its environs is a pretty serious one. And what's been really rewarding for me to see with patients coming in to NETA is how many individuals who come in with a list of opiates that they're taking and now after three years are really proud of the fact for themselves that what they're able to do is to no longer take many of the drugs that they were. So again, it's not a silver bullet, but to be able to see so many individuals who are struggling who aren't now, um, it seems to me that when we say we need to do more research, you know, a piece is to change what the federal government is so we're allowed to do research. There's a professor at UMass who for many years has wanted to do research and each time his applications have been turned down. And that's why it's so great that a piece of what NETA is doing is actually doing that research. But in terms of the opiate issue, there are individuals now in Northampton that aren't dealing with opiates because of medical marijuana. Mr. Kisa, did I see you? Uh, and? Uh, Michael Kisa, 26 Center Street here in Northampton. Um, I think. Uh, the, with the commission kicking the um, cafe and delivery uh, to 2019 creates a particular issue around uh, the conversations for public use mm -hmm. in Northampton because um, I think uh, cannabis tourism, um, particularly Northampton, a city with its progressive reputation, uh, uh, will probably draw cannabis tourists. and. Um, without having the option for public consumption in cafes, people who are coming to Northampton to consume will be looking for places and options to consume that because they probably won't be able to do it in their hotel rooms. Um, they're probably not going to be able to do it on the street. So, so by kicking that down the road, the commission, I think, creates an issue around people coming into Massachusetts um, who will want to come here to buy and use cannabis recreationally. So I think it's created a bit of a quandary, um, uh, I think, for tourists and the whole tourism, which I think would be a boon for the city of Northampton. Um, and I also think when you're looking at downtown and a cap on the number of um, cannabis uh, uh, businesses that could be downtown, um, you know, I can't believe I'm actually going to say this in a public forum because I'm kind of a socialist, but, you know, I think the free market will sort a lot of that out. <laughs> and now I've said it. <laughs> but um, the free market will sort a little bit of that out because, I mean, I mean I, I, I've lived downtown for 15 years and I feel that way about cell phone stores. And so there are too many of them. But I think uh, at least around the public consumption, um, I think that we're going to have to work. Our, the the stores that come into the city and the um, and the police force and the public board of public health are going to have to work closely to figure out what to do around tourism. Um, uh, Ms. Say your last name again. Swobus. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank Council Klein for bringing up the evidence part. Um, the board of health recently had a presentation about wait for it, 
safe injection sites. And so um, we are on new territory. And so the evidence on opioids and the evidence on this is just beginning to come out and most public health research is always lags behind because we need a lot of good experience. So I can see where it's contradictory. I want to go back to the opportunity. The Nutter saw an opportunity um, by bringing an establishment into Northampton and they embrace that opportunity by thinking it through based on what you've said here tonight. Um, this is where we make the sausage. And so again, I want to say we have an opportunity. It's not about a restrictive opportunity. It's an opportunity to address what we know now and what we can do within the confines of, of this, of the Cannabis uh, Commission. So um, I, I'd just like us to, to embrace this in, in more of a, okay, how do we want to shape this for our community? Do we, do we want cannabis tourism? Do we, what do our businesses want? Well, I mean, I'm not sure we know. And so this is the, the task before us, or the challenge before us. Um, was there someone else who wanted to say something? Yeah, I was just one question back to uh, Netta. Um, could you describe just what the what will be different physically once once there's basically two operations going on in the, in the, in the same facility? How will how will that I look differently than how it looks now? There's a um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a requirement in the regulations of uh, separation between medical and adult use and. Um, it's proposed to be virtual, uh, but there is an idea of a physical barrier. It's unclear exactly where that physical barrier is. <coughs> is it in the packaging? Is it, you know, at separate checkouts? Um, so pending that determination, NETA may have to make minor changes as far as where you can go to checkout or the process of the packaging itself. But it's not going to be a noticeable difference. Um, I don't want to opine too much or speculate too much as to how detailed it would be because I just I don't have that information. Uh, but we do expect that it's something that will be manageable and able to be done in our current location, you know, current location as things are. Sure. So you're expecting it to be, it'd be a, a single entrance as opposed yes. to two entrances? That's unclear mm -hmm. how the deep, how the CCC plans to regulate it. Um, I would imagine that they would take into consideration the fact that the establishments have been up and running a certain way for a certain period of time and what cost it would take to make those changes. Um, I it originally was stated as virtual separation, which would just be at the point of sale, um, and that's what the CAB recommended to the CCC. However, they've indicated they do want some sort of physical barrier. Um, and again, that only applies to places like Meta. It wouldn't be for any other type of uh, retail establishment, just for adult use and, and medical. And Amanda might have something to supplement too. No, I think I, I can cover it. Does that answer well, I, I guess I have one last comment. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. So I, my, um, I grew up, my dad is a, is a radical political economist, I had taught at Hampshire for 30 years. And um, I just have to say the free market stuff isn't funny to me because this is big business. This is tobacco. This is alcohol. It isn't like just farm stand stuff. And I know they've built in a lot of flexibility for small craft you know, growers and things, but also a very quick escalation path for growing big. And this is big business. And you know, again, it, it, I don't think it's all going to look like Netta, you know, as much as we would like it to. And so I just want to say that. It's, this is big business. It's not, it's not like small, small stuff. <laughs> Oh, and I just want to thank everyone. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we need, though. We need public discourse. And thank you for hosting this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, please. I'll go away. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. My name is Rosa Topping. I live on 45 Olive Street. Um, so a lot of things that I'm hearing tonight are all in regards to public consumption and a lot of fears relating to that. Um, so I think something that's super important for everyone to consider is mixed-use licensing and permits. Um, people want to open cafes, catering services, yoga studios, things of that nature. If you have more places like that where people have access to different forms of cannabis in a safe, private establishment, you won't have as many people smoking out on the streets. You'll also start to normalize it more so that all of these children will start to kind of learn about cannabis as just being 
another herb that it's a very powerful herb, but it's still, you know, something that has great benefits for a lot of people and something that can be really normal. It can be used totally normally, it can be used every day, and people function regularly. So I think it's just very important for us all to consider mixed use licensing and having really clear definitions on what that is versus a retail establishment. You know, retail that might be more of like that big money, big business, but I think it's really important as a small city and a big town to really focus on these like mixed use places where people will have options to kind of dabble in cannabis and kind of have this experience and learn a little bit more about it without it being this big, huge business taking over downtown. It doesn't have to be that way. So I would just like to remind people that there's a huge world that kind of revolves around cannabis and it's not just smoking it, it's using it topically, it's using it orally. Um, and so I'd like to just see a big focus on that and ways that we can make it more fair for other people, smaller players, to get into the market. Actually, this definitely, would you, sorry to make you get up again, but, um, <laughs> I'm not sure I get up this time. <laughs> Mixed use is different than the social consumption locations, which have been sort of have been put off by the CCC. Um, as far as we know, mixed use will still be licensed. Right? So it depends on what you consider mixed use. Um, if your mixed use is a lounge where you smoke cannabis and you also have beer, or you know, I mean not beer, but some other type of entity, then that's not going to be allowed at this point. Um, the CCC is currently in its, or today was the second day of debating, so these things are kind of in flux at the moment. And forgive me if I don't have the most update information, but as of yesterday, uh, the CCC did vote to delay um, any more discussion about social consumption and delivery of any kind for retail establishments until October 31st, at which time the, CC, the CAB will submit recommendations to the CCC um, on how to, how to do that, um, how to do those things, and then the CCC will have a public comment period on draft regulations, and it'll go through the same process we just went through now. So the earliest you would see any sort of decision on uh, social consumption or delivery of any kind for retail would be next February. And that's not to say they're going to allow it, it's just to say that's when we would have any kind of decision. Um, it's up to you, you guys, I guess, and the rest of the people in the town to determine how that looks for Northampton, what that looks like, um, and you know, I would encourage that conversation to be ongoing. Um, it doesn't have to wait until then, but you're not gonna have concrete regulations on which to base those decisions until at least next February. Um, so mixed use, again, it kind of depends, and there is more to be sorted out there as well. Um, but I think at this point, the answer is big, I don't know. <laughs> and no one does, but having the conversations now is, is a great place to start. Does that help? Yes, I thank you. I <laughs> sure. appreciate you being willing to. No problem. That's what I'm here for. Anybody else? Please. Hi, my name is um, Patricia Malone. I live in Florence Center. I'm sorry that I'm late. I just got off work and I don't want to jump in and be overly repetitive, so I'll keep it to just a minute or two um, to raise my concerns. And I'd like to thank on behalf of my neighbors as well. Um, so first of all, thank you all. Um, I moved to this town seven or eight years ago. And I've been so pleased with the way things are thoughtfully done in terms of development, the way our parks are done, um, the way we've created this beautiful downtown area. And I want us to continue in that same thoughtful vein to create um, uh, solutions and policy that serve everyone, for whether it's business people or uh, you know, children or adults in the neighborhood. Um, and my main concerns are that we would please maximize whatever tax for revenue so that we can support um, education, enforcement, uh, safety of children, and also not underbid our neighbors. I also am very interested in thoughtful zoning to keep this away from children. Um, I'm sure folks have talked about brain development and other concerns as well. And then um, I would encourage you to consider keeping it out of the town center and pedestrian areas to make this more of a transaction and not necessarily a public experience. Uh, and there's a few other concerns that I don't think we have the power to, to address necessarily, but you know, how do we label this? Um, what do we understand about dosage? What do people understand when they find the packaging outside of the context of a, a store or cafe? And then how do we monitor driving, right? How do we understand if people are impaired um, and how we can address concerns around uh, safety 
of our pedestrians in our town centers. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Anybody else? Thoughts? What about our committee? Well, I, I, since, since the question of, of uh, monitoring driving safety just came up, I know that's a huge issue. I'm just wondering if anyone wants to offer an update on the science of that and, and, and where. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't necessarily. I just went in that direction. I felt like I was. Yes, uh, I'll give the first shot. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with uh, one of the aides to uh, uh, one of the senators who was on the joint committee in the legislature last year uh, that was focusing on marijuana policy. And he told me that they had a parade of entrepreneurs come through their office trying to <laughs> peddle various gadgets to detect marijuana impairment. And they sort of, he sort of rolled his eyes. They're all over the place. I've got my views on that subject. First of all, there is one gadget that I think shows some promise. It was written up in the Boston Globe the other day. It's called Druid. It's, a, it's an app that, that you can download on your cell phone. Where, and you take this test on, on, on the Druid, and it determines whether or not you're impaired. <laughs> I don't know how accurate it is. I think we do have, actually, a method of impairment. And I've been pushing this for some time. It's an old method, and it's a very reliable one. It's called a field sobriety test. I suggest that we make it a practice to subject drivers who are suspected of being impaired to a standard field sobriety test. In my view, if a person can't touch his nose or count to 10 or recite the alphabet backwards, you pull up maybe for forward, please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he shouldn't be driving. He shouldn't be driving if he can't do those things. What if he's impaired by marijuana or alcohol or, or prescription drugs or fatigue for that matter? But there's one other thing that we can add to that, and that's video. If, if uh, police cruisers had videos in them, or cops were wearing body cams, and they made a record of the the operation of the motor vehicle that, 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 that seized his attention in the first place. They made a record of the, the motorist's response when he tried to pull him over, made a, made a record of the conversation with the motorist, and most importantly, made a record of the field sobriety test. Then, if the driver wants to challenge his arrest, you show the video to the judge or jury and let them decide. No fancy equipment. Not a lot of money, not a lot of complication. Use the tools, tools we have, the field sobriety test, but put it under the watchful gaze of a video camera. That's my suggestion. We can note that Northampton cruisers do have video cameras in them, actually. Indeed, yes. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I think those all sound like really good ideas. And the only thing I would want to add is that when working with youth and even adults I know who use recreationally, <coughs> would just be more of an educational campaign, which Netta could certainly help with, about just raising awareness that you might feel like you're more cautious when you're driving when you're high, but it's not accurate. <laughs> you know, So all of the things that Mr. Evans just suggested, but also Colorado has had some great campaigns as a state about, they have this really, have you seen them? They're funny yeah. and they're very humorous and it's all about like, you know, some of it is just outlining rules. Like if you're a tourist, like, you know, you can buy it here, but you can't take it there, and, and, and things about driving. So having that be part of the city would be a great way as well to just raise awareness for youth and for adults that it's not a practice you should be engaging in, and then have the videos and everything else as well. Um, so speaking as a Cannabis Advisory Board member, I would like to alert you and everyone in the room to the materials that are available on the Cannabis Control Commission's website. Um, the advisory board is the body tasked with making recommendations to govern regulations and as part of our process of deliberations we gathered and discussed all a, a wealth of information specifically addressing a lot of these issues here that are not in the final regulations but they, st they serve to help make those regulations. Um, again, there's not, not everything that's there is in the regulations but you can go there and see where we've addressed um, how should you regulate security. Um, for different types of businesses, not just R&Ds, but um, you know, a standalone retail that is just adult use. Um, what kind of security, what would that look like? Um, local level issues that I think would be very helpful to what you guys are 
trying to determine here. Um, so again, that's on the Cannabis Advisory Board website, a portion of the CCC website, and there's just a wealth of information that you might not find helpful. Anybody else? You all again? Any other? No? Oh, please. Jeff Garfield. I'm um, from Aqua. I'm 23 years old and I'm a marijuana user. Um, I just want to speak to the importance of getting this set up right just for the fact of that marijuana you get on the street isn't the same marijuana you get in these stores. It would be nice to have more stores available to supply with a healthier tested product. I think the testing is the extreme importance here and finding what you get from a shop is what it says. What you get on the street isn't always the same. It's not tested. There's all different kinds of problems that can arise with that. I think just limiting the shops is a problem. I think that there should be more available and there should be more testing, all of that importance. Um, also to the products, I think that having <laughs> Products like a chocolate bar, products like vapes are healthier alternatives to your natural smoking. Um, and I think that education on that should be more brought forward, perhaps in public forums, perhaps on maybe a PBS News Hour on education <laughs> on how to inform the public. But I think that's where we're really lacking is on the education that marijuana isn't just marijuana. Um, becoming a medical patient has changed my life. It's saved my life more times than one. Um, and I just want to speak on the importance of that marijuana isn't always marijuana, that there's different types of different kinds and how you use it in education is the importance here. As Mr. Evans said before, marijuana has been around forever. It's not like it's a new product or anything, but there's new ways to use it. There's new ways that we're finding that it's helping and benefiting. And I just hope that we can get it done. I'm really concerned and I hope we can get this established. But thank you. I just want to speak. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Anybody else? No? And again? <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming out and, and sharing your thoughts with us. I know we're, we're we all are listening. And um, and please, again, uh, Legislative Matters is um, meeting at 7 o'clock, and we'll go over the zoning proposal. Those as well, um, and uh, potentially all of these um, will be at council on Thursday. The um, the tax question will be at the finance committee on Thursday, um, and then if, if these uh, zoning proposals <coughs> leave legislative matters, then um, will they? Yes, they will be on that agenda as well. So um, thank you very very much, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate um, everyone's input. Thank you. Yes, thank thank you. you for your time.